Judgment Achter versus the British Eight, the prime boat of the Olympics. And this is a really great start from Great Britain and Germany. So who's it going to be? Germany or Great Britain? Germany or Great Britain? It is New Zealand. New Zealand just starting to pull out a bit of an advantage here. They're around a quarter of a boat length ahead. I find it kind of, kind of absurd when people talk about people not involved in, in elite sports. They say, ah, we only made so, so many medals. No, no, no. We didn't make any medals. Zero. <laughs> We watched other people work their butt off for a salary that a lot of people wouldn't even lift their hand for if they get any salary at all, then they possibly make a medal. Hello and a very warm welcome here to today's video analysis. Today it's all about the Olympic 8, the man's 8 of 2021 in Tokyo. And that was a good surprise to quite a few of us. New Zealand just starting to pull out a bit of an advantage here. See, before Rio, the Olympics before that, before Tokyo 21, everybody, no, at least I had the impression that there was exactly one, in, in terms of media work, heavily discussed and published battle that would actually decide between gold and silver. The battle between Germany and Great Britain. So the Germans had that early lead, the British should now start to come back with a purpose, led by Lance Treadle, there you can see. They just have so many medals in that boat, I'm surprised it hasn't sunk. And interestingly, as the Olympic Games then come up, every four years, or five years this time, we are in for a good surprise. It's not that easy. British rowing is very well funded, as most people know. I think the, the British rowing funding system is causing quite a bit of envy across the globe because not a lot of rowing systems are so well funded. Well, the German 8 on the other hand side is the Deutschland Achter, is actually its own company. Yes, you're hearing correctly. It's the Deutschland Achter GmbH, which is essentially a limited company. So they turned that boat into a brand with a protected brand name. Talking about marketing here. After this great result of the Dutch 8 in Rio. Germany second and the Netherlands third. They have done it. The Holland 8 became its own. I don't know if it's a brand actually, but it's Red Bull sponsored. And Red Bull usually doesn't mess around. I believe the Holland 8 is an excellent project. You've got the super well-funded British 8. You've got the privatized and branded Deutschland 8 from Germany. You got the Holland 8. Now you would think it's the battle of the finances. You, you, if, if you follow boats on social media, you somehow get the idea, these are the only boats in the world and there's nobody else. I have never heard about the New Zealand end being turned into a brand. And I'm not sure if, the, if, if, if New Zealand rowing is as well funded as British rowing is. Then there were two boats that I consider to be uh, quite a good bet for uh, the Olympic Games, and that was the very young Romanian eight. Now, now you can start to see. Oh, I think they're at 43 and a half. Uh, Romania has a lot of pedigree in the eight, especially in the women's eight, but also in the men's eight. And they started with a bunch of youngsters and produced some amazing results. And then there was the Australian eight. Fantastic Australian boat. Josh Hicks with the yellow cap there in the two. With spectacular technique, as I think. I like the way they use their upper bodies. After seeing their results in uh, Henley, especially 2018, I figured if Australia can produce such an exceptional four, they probably know how to put the right people in the right boat and build a very good man's eight. But for Australia, it didn't work out. They only quote unquote made the A final, which is not as easy as you think it is. You know, we are all sitting here comfortably in our sofas wherever you're watching this video and you think, oh, not even A final. <laughs> you, have, you have to work your butt off just to make it into the national team. Then you have to work your butt off twice um, to make it to the Olympics. And then uh, if there's some butt left, you, you have to work the remainder of it off just to make, um, make the A final. Not even talking about making medals. If you watch the race from a New Zealand perspective, they go off with a pretty high stroke rate. They are not in the lead until about the 1000 meter mark. There's a very good video of them. Tony Connor, their coach, uh, posted a very interesting video where he showed how to, how the Kiwi 8 actually does a start. And the way they do it is for me the most impressive start that I've, I've, I've ever seen being recorded on video. 
usually when, when people start a race, and I'm not even talking about amateurs, I'm talking about world championship level juniors, under 23s, even Olympic level rowers, they all try to go out like crazy, like conquer the world the first 20 strokes, which is pretty much useless. The main idea, and this is generally, I think, a New Zealand style that I perceive to see across the entire team, is to get into the game at the start, so use the start to get into your rhythm, into your flow, to preserve your technique as much, as much as possible and build the race over the entire race course, rather than trying to get a psychological advantage, which is nonsense in my humble opinion, uh, in, in a race. Because for New Zealand, there was zero psychological advantage. That is about uh, the first 500, somewhere in the middle. And New Zealand is everywhere, but not in the lead. It's Germany in the lead. And then everybody else is on par with them, except for the Australian aid. They're already behind at the start. This is a nice comparison of boat speeds. It's pretty much 300 meters after the start. New Zealand has progressively built their speed over the first 300 meters, and they're now 23 kilometers an hour. They're faster than a German aid at 22.7. And interestingly, Germany, Netherlands, Britain, Australia, and the US are all at 22.7 kilometers an hour. The only boat that is faster is the New Zealand 8. Now, if we rewatch the way to do the start, this shows us quite something. In my humble opinion, building speed progressively, understanding that we need to keep our cruising altitude as high as possible for most of the race. By that, I mean, don't try to, don't try to have the speed at stroke number four, try to have this, this, your your style, your desired speed at stroke number 20 or 25 seems to pay off more because you don't cramp your body, you don't contract muscles, you don't want to contract. I will only talk about the Kiwi in that stretch. 500 meters, they are in third position, chased by the Americans, Australians have a length behind the British, Germany and Britain, the classic battle, both of them in the lead, side by side. A 120-36 for the German, it's an okay pace. Just kidding, it's ridiculously fast. We don't see much of the of their technique here, unfortunately. Their bowman is about two seats behind the Germans. That is quite a number. I'm not, I'm not sure about the perspective here, but they're certainly not quite side by side. Is that a psychological disadvantage? No, not if you have a proper race plan. And of course, everybody had a proper race plan, but in my humble opinion, I repeat myself, I think the Kiwis build for the entire race. They don't just build for, oh, we got to be in the lead at the 1,000. Um, it's more elaborate than that. Interestingly, now, at just about the halfway mark, let's have a nice speed comparison here. New Zealand is the fastest boat. Still, their speed dropped to, dropped to 22 and a half kilometers per hour. They're still faster than everybody else. And I think this is progressively eating away the lead of the Germans and of the British. If your overall pace is not high enough, it's going to be very, very difficult to stop a boat. If your overall boat speed is slower than somebody else's, and just a tiny bit, what it does, it, it, it creates a, a psychological disadvantage, I think. What usually aids them do 10 hard strokes. Now, what this does is you go above your typical workload in a race. And I've made a lot of videos and drop it in the comments if I should re-explain everything. Physiologically speaking, what this does to you is that you build up a lot of lactate within these 10 to 15 strokes that cannot be deteriorated throughout the rest of the race. You're putting yourself in a pretty bad position because you're creating lactate peaks and these peaks don't go away. They stay there. It's gonna be about halfway mark here. So let's say you are at eight millimum of lactate or nine. Then you do 10 to 15 hard strokes or 20. All of a sudden you jump from eight or nine to 11. Now, a lot of people cannot do more than 13 millimole of lactate. There are exceptions that could do 20, 22 millimole of lactate, but that is a rare thing. Then you have to race with the elevated lactate state, and that causes huge problems. I'm not sure if Germany did that. I'm stating this as a general warning, but what I do see is that the overall speed changes in the German and British boat are greater than in the New Zealand boat. Halfway mark, New Zealand is in the lead. They were not in the lead at the start, they were not at the lead at the 500. They were about to work their way up into the lead. One and a half seats plus the bow. This is what they gained because their overall boat speed was higher 
just a tiny bit. Maybe, I'm not quite sure, but maybe this was possible because they allowed themselves a bit more time to get into their game rather than trying to storm ahead. This is about nuances because everybody's trying to get into the lead at the start or everybody's trying to be ahead of the game as much as possible. I would say the general physical level of most of these athletes is at least comparable. There may be super exceptions and there may be exceptions of people which are actually slower, but their technique is so good. At that level, I do think that this is not so much about personal power anymore, it's about how coherently the eight works together. The bigger the team boat, the greater the common understanding of how to move a boat, the faster the overall speed will be in develop. If you look at boat speeds now, this is gonna be about the 1250 to 1500 meter mark. New Zealand still has the fastest boat speed on the water, just by 0.2 kilometers an hour. Germany is now doing what I consider to be a push and Great Britain is doing the same. However, New Zealand will be able to hold the pace while Germany and Great Britain pays to their change of boat speed. Changing the speed of an eight is not so easy. It's a heavy boat, it weighs 100 kilos. These eight people, if they average 90 kilos, that's 820 kilos. So with the coxswain and a bit of, a bit of weights ups and downs, we're anywhere between 850 and 900 kilos, so close to a ton. A full ton, you don't change the speed of a full ton, a weight, so rapidly. Their progressive build over the entire race has paid off in a way that they have half, half a length up on Germany, Great Britain, and the US. This is one of the very few technique shots we get of them. The way they use the upper bodies all together is fantastic. You will always find differences. Okay, that person's using it a bit earlier than the other one. Yes, that's, that's true. You never know about the physique. Some, some people may have a longer trunk, some people may have a shorter trunk. Ultimately, when I coach people, I do judge by the optics, but mostly I try to read the force curves. So have them on a the bi rower. I try to understand how to influence the boat with their particular style. And sometimes I end up that people actually look different when they row, but they influence the boat the same way because their anthropometrics, the way their bodies are built are different. So in order to compensate for that, I'd sometimes literally ask people to row differently, optically speaking, but there are limits to that, of course. Look at the bowman. Look at that finish. <laughs> right, right, right that, it makes me, it makes me smile. This is so beautiful. This is so elbow position, um, the trunk stability. This is Olympic final, 250 meters to go. And this guy still rows this way. That's heartwarming. For me, this is, this is the beauty of rowing. It makes me very, very, very happy to see this. Hamish Bond here, big name, number two seed. He's got his own unique style, but I think he adapted super well into this eight. He's such a versatile athlete. Greatest respect to him. Three seed, beautiful, all the tension in the finish. <sighs> a joy, absolute joy to watch this. So nice. And the way they use the upper bodies, leg drive, use mass, collected finish, boom, out. Ladies and gents, this is, it is staggeringly beautiful. Rowing, rowing this way, just before the finish line, Olympic final, you know you got the gold medal at your hands. That is quite something. Great Britain and Germany, they have tried to build speed massively. The Dutch have built speed massively just to go with them. The Americans have built speed massively. But the overall boat speed of the Kiwis is so high, it is impossible to catch them. They reach their lactate states more gradually rather than creating peaks and trying to cope with peaks for the rest of the race. That for me is how you need to row an eight with the upper body swing using the full length and the effectiveness of the upper body. They have a third of a boat length lead over the Germans. The Kiwi 8 is not their own brand. I don't know how well founded they are. Came out of nowhere. I don't think so. I mean, Hamish Bond is a big name. There are some other very, very accomplished rowers in there. But again, this, this is, and some people say, yeah, but rowing is national sport in New Zealand. Their program is big. All true. All very true. But they didn't show up in the scene too much before Rio. They essentially took the time between Rio and Tokyo 
to start to build an age and put all their strength into that boat. And that is something that impresses me personally. Next boat, let's talk about the race from a German perspective. Talking about the German aid, Deutschland Achter. This is their website, deutschlandachter.de with Germany. Essentially, it's the website only featuring their aid. Um, there's also the under 23 aid. They have big selections, try to publish these selections and make it make it almost an event. They have sponsors, Deutschland Achter GmbH. That is quite something. You can buy fan stuff, get autographs. You can even buy their rowing suits. They have their own line of clothing. So now I've got this big boat with a lot of media presence also in German TV, so they pop up everywhere um, trying to build a reputation, a brand, trying to build a system just around that one boat to make the fastest aid in the world, which is, I think, a cool thing. It's quite a challenge to live up to the expectations that you create with such a brand. And this is what I tried to talk about initially in the video. Oh, we didn't even make the gold medal. <laughs> Try to make one. Try to make one. It's like one, one Austrian coach once told me um, 15 years ago when I tried to establish the buyer rower and tried it in Austria first. <laughs> and he said, well, you know, Aram, you can become Olympic champion without this as well. And I said, hey, buddy, you're Austrian. I'm Austrian. We've never ever in the history of Olympic Games had one Olympic champion in rowing. Shouldn't you use every bit of advantage you could possibly get. So, the Germans are the leaders right from the start. And they must be one of the most powerful boat of them all. That's about 250 meters into the race. They are already one, I think a full bow in the lead over a British. And the British are not necessarily known to be slow starters or to build the race progressively. <laughs> Germany is at that stage still on par with the Kiwis, 23 kilometers an hour. At that stage, their pace will drop now. 500 meter, Germany in the lead. Alles geht nach Plan. The interesting thing about the German aid is that they are pretty much unified in a way to row, except for one guy, and that's the bowman. I, I've talked about you know optics before, and, and you shouldn't judge by visual impressions, but the way the bowman rolls is so vastly different that I do believe that the effect he creates on the boat must be a completely different effect. Now, I gotta say, full disclaimer, there's probably a good reason why he rose the way he rose. I just don't understand it. Based on everything I've ever seen, read, learned, experimented with, tried out, a more guy likes to try out things and see the results. If you use your upper body that early at the catch, you will create a different force curve than everybody else. 1,000 meter mark, the Germans are not in the lead anymore. They are in third position behind the British. That is not the spot they wanted to be at. And you may think, okay, it's only 0 0.25 seconds. In, in an eight, this is quite a bit. Again, we're talking about moving eight to 900 kilos of mass and changing its speed. It's not so easy. That That is probably a good shot. I'm pretty sure he's in there for a good reason. I'm pretty sure this guy's strong as a horse and the coaches have done everything they can to find the right people who bring the, the best possible boat speed. Stability in the bow is a key thing. That's probably his main job. I'm pretty sure he's in there for a reason. They got Olympic silver. There are not a lot of people in the world who can call themselves Olympic silver medal winners. That's all legit. I just don't get it why he rose the way he rose. He rotates with the upper body before his legs even engage. Now, he could have stayed there at the catch. He, he, he wouldn't have, he, there was no need to do the extra nod forward because it's essentially an empty motion. On the negative side, what it does, it brings the blade off the water. Or you can compensate and bring the in outside shoulder in, which is what he does. We're going to see it later on. I'm going to try to pick on him. I think, I think I've been polite enough to that stage. But again, I've got eyes. I see things and I can comment on things. And that is pretty, pretty obvious in my humble opinion. So if you're the bow guy of this eight and you see this video, 
um, maybe you can drop me a message and say, hey, I was asked to row that way, or that's just my style, it's so difficult to change, or I, I don't need to change. It works so well, we get Olympic silver, all good, all well accepted. If you look at number two and three seed, and number four seed, and number five seed, number six, number seven seed, and number eight seed, that all looks different. His angle of upper body is vastly different, which means, in my humble opinion, is that he creates a peak, a force curve peak, very early, especially the more tired he becomes. At the beginning, there's probably nothing, nothing, nothing there. It's a massive peak that is probably impressively massive here. And then it's, it's a steady decline. As far as I know, and as far as my experience goes, the eight is such a long boat as opposed to a, a pair or even a four that you do want almost symmetrical power application unless you have people with uneven strength in the boat. And that is well possible within the German eight. You know, there's tandem rig and all the other stuff you can use to try to balance out individual um, benefits or deficits. Of course, the timing is the same, but just before the catch, the blade is away from the water. Everybody sees this. And now in order to get the blade into the water, the upper body rotates. Now there's peak force on the blade and everybody else is doing it differently. If everybody else were using the upper body that early, I still would consider this to be inefficient. But to me, what stands out is the difference in rowing styles uh, this German aid branded Deutschland Achter has with the Bauman having, having such a different technique. So if anybody's got inside knowledge, please drop it in the comments below. I'm super curious or, or send me an email or drop me a message on Instagram or Facebook or Rowing Zone. I'd be so curious to learn why this is the case. And I'm pretty sure you guys have do, done a lot with force curves. Yeah, you can even now see it from the back. Boom, upper body engages very early. See this right there? The lady is not in the water, upper body already engaging. It's almost smacking the water. <laughs> Very interesting. His entire technique seems to be set up to create an early peak of force. That, that is for me almost impossible. You cannot create a lot of force that way. Or in comparison to what you physically would be able to do. Very interesting styles. Ultimately, it's all about how much force can you bring on the blade and in which way. And apparently this works out for this German 8. This has got to be an awesome feeling here. The rest of the German 8 is actually super well together. Impressive in their in their performance. That early start pace, fantastic. And even if it's Olympic silver now, and, and maybe you guys were hoping for Olympic gold like everybody does, just being in the lead and then having a medal, that's a very rare thing. And uh, you can be very happy. <laughs> awesome. The Germans did have to make their push as a response to the Kiwi push. Probably they were already at their max capacity. Maybe they went out too hard at, at the start. Maybe they were looking more to hold off the British and not so much to hold off the Kiwis, but the Kiwis already won their heat. So if I'm not mistaken, but they posted a staggeringly fast time. One thing, maybe it's the color of the boat. To me, it appears that the bow of the German eight pops out more than um, the other boats every time at the catch, but maybe it's just the color. I think there's the sponsor's color. For the rest, what the German eight does super well is they use their upper bodies early like many very early here number uh, six no number five seed here number five seed uses the upper body also quite early so there are a few differences in the way they use their upper bodies it's not as massive as with the bowman but it looks to me either they didn't care too much about it or it simply was not or it simply is, is a desired effect. But there could be something else the case. So this is becoming a very long video, but there are many thoughts that go into this. And I usually take a lot of notes here and a lot of things that come to my mind. My impression is that a lot of selection mechanisms in, in these eights, especially in Deutschland, it's not like you build an eight and you try to unify that eight or that boat so that the boat actually works together as a team. They influence the boat the same way they have a joint understanding of how to move the boat. That was the case, for example, with some of the um, of the Baltic quadruple skulls we saw the last couple of years. Lithuanian, uh, Estonians. Um, they, first of all, they don't have a lot of people to choose from, but it also gives them the opportunity to really match the people they've got. 
my impression is that in these large systems, so British system, German system, not sure about the French system but uh, and the Italians, but I do think they do this as well, the American system. I'm not sure if, if uh, you guys in Australia do it that way as well, but I think in, in New Zealand it was not such a big deal. You tried a couple combos, but then you found it. But in these systems, the moment your earth times become worse, you consistently have to perform. There is no time for individual development in terms of, okay, you're here at that stage, even at that super pro level. Now, how can you, how can we make sure that everybody is at top top performance level on day on day zero? It's all about you have to perform every week, every second week. Oh. You need, you need a rest, mm, you cannot join the training. Well, let's sub somebody for you. Not being in the boat creates a lot of pressure, makes your recovery capacity less. That puts a lot of mental pressure. Well, it doesn't work without mental pressure. I'm not sure. Usually rowers who are at that level are motivated enough by themselves. So I'm not sure if that swapping out people is actually counterproductive when it comes to uniform or unifying the way people row. I see this a lot with the work on a bio rower where I think the most important thing is to understand that you move the boat the same way by creating the same type of force curves if that's what you desire. So the pair is a big exception, maybe the straight four as well. In the the influence you create cannot be matched. It could I will explain later on how it could be. But for most of the part for most part it cannot be matched because there's not enough time. It's all about, okay, he's in. How is it going today? Well, it's going fine. There is surprisingly little professional data that even the big teams use. Um, you, you, you would wonder how beneficial would it be for, for these Olympic teams, um, for teams like Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, Yale, Cal, all the big ones, if they had an indoor biro or eight with full force curves, something like this, for example, and they could actually match up their force curves and say, hey, this is how I row, this is how you row, let's, let's make sure we have the same influence. You know, your body's built different than mine, you've got long and legs, different anthropometrics, but let's still try to create the same influence, having a, a common handwriting. And my impression is that if I look across these boats, the commonality of handwriting is the deciding factor whether or not you're fast, along with how do you structure the race and how strong are you individually. My impression is that right now, even at Olympic level, as we see it here, it's mostly about consistent performing, it's mostly about having to top your own results all the time, being under pressure all the time, and coaches need to be 100% sure to put the right people in the boat based on our times. There are exceptions where people, uh, I heard coaches say, okay, we put somebody who's slower in the boat, but he just made the boat go faster. These are the interesting choices. I think that that is what separates um, the exceptionally great coaches from very good coaches. So at the 1000 meter mark, that was the first time the Germans fell behind. You can't really see it. I mean, this is also crazy. Talk about rowing, talk about small margins. Everywhere else you talk about, oh, he's got a second behind, you got two tenths of a second, that's how many percent? We, we're not talking about percent in rowing. We're talking about per thousands. That is how close rowing races are. Interesting. You see this as well? I'm realizing something. Look at number one and number three seat in a German boat. Number three seat is using the upper body extensively at the catch as well. Not as much as number one seat. Boom. Same way. Same way. Interestingly, the port side isn't. The port side is not doing this. So number number one side on bow side, number two, uh, so number one seat on bow side, number three seat also bow side are forming a technique contrast to their counterparts on port side. Let's go back a few frames.
I'm trying to do thorough video analysis here. So if, if that is not a short entertaining video, I would say, ha ha, he he, look at them, it's just so good. I'm, I'm trying to be spot on, trying to distill the difference, just find out all the little details, and there would be so much more to talk about. Check one, two, three, four. Just look at the body angles now at the kitchen. That is, I gotta say, the Bowman is actually not alone with his way of rowing. Let's look at number five, also bow seat. Pretty round, hunched back. It's gonna be a big man. Low hands. Blades should be about to touch the water. Yeah, he's also rotating the upper body, not as badly, but he does. Look at his counterpart. No, interesting. I mean, you could, you could argue that it's different perspectives and you, say you cannot judge. But hey, if, if you have looked at a lot of sweep rowers, you get a good idea of what body positions and proportions look like when they move in a certain way. So um, most coaches will probably agree with me here. Let's look at seven seat. How does he do this? No. He's using the upper body later. So there is, there is a disproportional use of the, of, the, of the upper bodies. I think it becomes more extreme as we come to the bow. The bow man is significantly different than even everybody else. I do see early upper body use of almost everybody, but the bow guy does his own thing here. In terms of tactics, their boat speed is second fastest. Does it automatically result in their silver medal? Not quite sure, but you also see the Netherlands having the fourth fastest boat speed um, I think they get fifth just behind the Americans. Did you see this? Look at that massive hold. Massive hold of the upper body and leverage. Oh. <laughs> Makes me a very happy man. I, and I do think that these are the differences that technique does pay off at the highest level in particular. And I do think that this is the reason why, why the Kiwis pull ahead. This is why they won ahead of the Germans usage, the combined usage of upper body versus the Germans, in my humble opinion, it was certainly not the only factor, but it was one important factor next to building progressively speed over the entire race. The British went out hard at the start along with the Germans. The British were basically neck and neck with the, with the Germans right at the start. There's one interesting thing. Just after the start, everybody was at 45. Two boats were at 43, the Germans and the British. As if they were tied together, as if they had had so many battles one-on-one -on -one before, that's just their racing style. As far as I'm informed, uh, the British 8 is or was actually coached by a German for a long time. Dropping to a 43 and being in the lead, for me, signifies a very power-based start phase. Not so much focusing on playfulness, bringing up speed. New Zealand is still at a 47 then. New Zealand is still at a 45, not being in the lead. More strokes per minute, slower boat speed. Less strokes per minute on the British and German side, higher boat speed. That's a lot of power. Maybe that is a small indicator that these two boats, and especially the British here, as we're watching the British closely, have spent too much energy during the start, and the result of that was a lactate peak. First boat speed comparison, 22.7, 22.7. Interesting. Same stroke rate, same boat speed. The only boat that is faster are the Kiwis with 23. But everybody else here, except for the Dutch, are at 22.7. Talking about their style, I think if I had to show anybody, um, excuse me, what does a rowing eight look like when it's when, it, when it's rowing well, um, I'd say just look at the British eight. You can't go wrong with that. I think it's more effective to row like the Australians or uh, the Kiwis. Although you may say now, ah, oh, the Australians, they only got sixth. You, you never know what happened. You never know about physique. You never know if they actually put the strongest guys in the boat. But the way the Kiwis and the Australians row, I think is the most effective style. But in terms of the easiest style to understand, I would look at the British. The way, they're the most unified boat of them all, I think. 
especially in comparison to the Dutch I will talk about later, they're pretty disciplined when it comes to upper body use. You don't see big exceptions, leg drive, short leg drive, massive upper body, not much of a backswing. Interesting, in, interesting the tandem rig here in the, in the center. So you get a port side stroke and a port side bow. Maybe five seed is a bit early with his upper body, but again, stabilize at the moment the, the leg drive starts. So let's go back a couple of frames. Yeah, super stable, using the upper body together, not using much upper body at the finish. Would the British have used more upper body at the finish? Would have been faster? Hard to say, I, I believe so, yes. If they would have rode the Australian style or uh, the New Zealand style, I do think that they'd have been faster, but it's, n it not, it's not easy to change a style that quickly. But it is possible, and I do think it would have paid off. Am I saying that, well, if the British had had a different technique, would they have won? I'm not sure if they would have won, but I'm pretty sure they would have had a higher boat speed. The way they roll, the way they move the boat, with they're trying to be patient on the front end with the upper body, and then having a pretty massive upper body use, but then again, not using a lot of backswing. That is unified across the entire boat. You don't see a lot of differences here. So it's, it's look at the German here. It's a, it's a very smooth style. It's a style that allows for high speeds very early in a race. You don't need a long stretch to build speed. One of the upsides of that style is, in my humble opinion, it does allow for quick speed changes if needed because the upper body use is not completely neglected. They do use the upper body. And the upper body is like the turbo in a rowing stroke. It, not so much the upper body, it, the motion should originate from, from, from the pelvis and rot help you rotate around the hip joint and use the entire trunk as one main lever. If that is possible, and you do it in unison, that's super fast. But again, it's the common influence in the boat. So I think in terms of commonality, besides the Kiwis and maybe the Australians, the British are doing it extremely well. At the same time, that style allows them to be at highest boat speeds very early. What is the downside? Their overall boat speed is not as high as it could be because they're missing the consistent upper body use. Upper body use in terms of using body weight. They're not using the body weight for as long as possible throughout the drive. And I think this is the reason why they are not up there with the Kiwis. And you say, oh, it's just a small margin. You're talking about 900 kilos or possibly a full ton in the British boat of mass. Changing speed and maintaining speed is very difficult. And you need all the nuances you can possibly get a hold of. Nice leg drive. Yeah. Accentuated upper body use, not much lean back. Boom, right in there. And I like one fine detail. You know, 4C doesn't lean back a lot because he's a tall dude. Um, 2C does lean back more because in comparison to him, he's probably small. He's probably still a super, super tall guy, but that's, that's his style of rowing. Beautiful. Very, very well thought out. This is where you see the full beauty of that British aid again. Yeah, there's nothing to say about this. If, if you would ask, say, hey, what, what should an aid look like? Um, refer to the British. That's where an aid is supposed to look like. It's very easy to, to, to transport as a picture. It all looks the same. And it all looks the same. It's got to be good. That this is not the case always. Every, I mean, insiders know that. But... Their, their style, their unif unison of technique, their unison of optics is, um, I think, is, is spectacular. It, there's nothing more to say about this. Yeah, enjoy and watch. The boat speed here, interestingly, the British do have the slowest boat speed of the top four, along with the, with the Dutch. And that's where the field is more together. So that's about mid-race, I think. And this is where they are trying to settle for a race pace. And this is where the German race pace is a bit higher, a 21.6. Still, the Kiwis are going at almost 22 kilometers an hour. So half a kilometer faster than the British. 
And I think what we see now is the battle between Germany and Britain. So for the British, they're very disciplined. I haven't seen anybody look out of the boat, which as we know from the Italians is not necessarily a bad thing. And they have Germany next to them with the Dutch in between, but they're half a boat length behind. So for them, feeling the energy of the Kiwis is difficult. The only ones who feel them are the Americans and the Germans. Would, have, would the British have been in the American spot in that lane, I do think that this would that Britain may have had an advantage over Germany, being pulled a bit by the Kiwis. But it again is just guesswork. 1500 meter mark. What is interesting here is there's a quite significant lead of the British over the Germans. They have had they had to spend a lot of energy to change boat speed massively to go from behind Germany to be leading Germany by almost a bow. That is a lot. And now for the last 500, they are at substantial lactate levels. 0.4 seconds ahead of the Germans. That is massive. Look how far they're up. I mean, it's also the perspective. It's slightly in a tilted angle, but that is quite something. And now you see the German bow ball slowly, slowly inching ahead of the British. Just, just before the finish line, the Germans made it to be neck and neck with the British. And once the eight is going, it's going. And this is where the Germans just pull ahead ever so slightly of the British. This is the tiniest margin. I, I, I don't think they even called, yeah, they didn't call the result. See this? They didn't call who's first, uh, who's second or third. They couldn't, they couldn't tell. And what is also interesting is the massive margin, surprising margin, between the British, the Germans, and the Americans. Because the Americans were pretty much on par with the two battle boats here, besides the Kiwis, for most of the race, except for the finished sprint. <music> Lastly, I want to talk about the Americans, the Dutch, and the Australians. The Australian technique, in my humble opinion, is beautiful, absolutely beautiful. They only got sixth at the Olympics. That is insane level. You never know all, all the stories behind that. You don't know about physical parameters. You don't know about good day, bad day, illness, not illness. If I were able to look at their training logs, I could probably spot overtraining, say, oh, this is here, you should have done that differently, that different, that or that. That's actually my key competence, training, planning, and all that stuff. But I don't have that information available, so all I can judge is technique. The way to row the Australians is they're super patient with the legs, all four in unison, and then use the upper body jointly. That is something that the Australian four has mastered. This has become a pretty long video analysis. Let me know how you like that format. But I'm trying to be as detailed as possible. There's a lot to say about this. Three seed is not using his upper body as much as two seed is. So you could say, okay, that's port and, and that's port side and bow side. So maybe optics deceive a bit. That's possible. We don't see the rest. We don't see um, the this, this stern three or stern four. It is not as unified as the British style. And it's not easy to get into the A final. There are some other good boats, like the Romanians, for example, that didn't make it into the A final. Uh, a word on the Dutch. The, the Holland 8, the, the Dutch 8, I think they, they have done significantly more marketing the last four years than before. And the good thing about these boats is also that it helps the entire federation, the entire sport. For example, from an Austrian perspective, when um, Magdalena Lopnik won, um, won bronze in Tokyo, for an Austrian perspective, this is very important because Austrian rowing now actually gets um, more funding. We don't get a lot of funding usually. That was very important. Was it, was it a, a federation's project? <laughs> no, <laughs> not at all. Um, it was pretty much a private project from the start. And I think this is one of the reasons why, why it worked. She was able to do what worked for her personally best. So she could, yeah, she could make the calls. And that, on the other hand side, because she was able to do her individual project with the Austrian Federation has tried to undermine with, with other, other projects heavily in the past, but they let her do her thing because she was so valuable um, that the risk of losing her was greater than, um, than not being able to follow through on a system, which was eventually the only smart thing to do and it paid off. So her bronze medal, for example, 
helped the Austrian Federation massively because rowing now had an Olympic medal. The last time we had an Olympic medal was, I think, 1992 in the men's double with um, Arnold Jonk and Christoph Zerbst. Ever since then, no Olympic medal in rowing. That is a long stretch. That is almost 20 years. The Holland Acht is something very important for the Dutch Federation, I personally believe. So, uh, comment on their technique. I do think that the Dutch style is not as unified as the British one. Some use the upper body early, some don't, and some don't use it not at all. And you see it here, just that one particular drive. Watch number three, four, and five. Set. At the finish, the timing is the same again. But throughout the drive, the influence and the motion of the upper body appears to be vastly different. Right here, four seat, brings the blade into the water, starts with the leg drive, and then whoop, the upper body sets in massively. Let's compare it same side, number two seat. Same style. Okay, two, four, six seat. uses the upper body quite early. See this? Brings the blade into the water with an upper body pivot. Boom. Now that does something to the force curves. Are they rowing badly? <laughs> Come on, it's Olympic A final. Nobody rows badly. They're all, I mean, these are the best, best aids in the world. Although I'd be very, very curious to see these Olympic aids go up against Oxford Brooks. I would love to see Oxford Brooks being part of that. Final. If, if we had a 10 lane or 12 lane race course, this would be my dream. Seven seed, five, three, and bow. I know you, a lot of people argue you cannot compare the side where you see the blades with the side where you don't see the blades, but I think I can. And you use the he uses the upper body very early. Same same here. Look at three seed. Not, not as much. It looks different to me. Let's look at bow seed. Yeah, bow seed does use the upper body, almost like the German bowman a bit. Uh, I mean, the question is, why are they behind almost a full length right after the start? Is it because they have a slow start? That's usually a typical Dutch style, um, have a slow start and progress over the race. But this time, I think the, the Kiwis uh, created a pace that was very difficult to cope with from a German and British perspective who like to go out hard and probably also from an American perspective. And the Dutch could not keep up with this, physically speaking. Possibly, I might be wrong, but possibly also because of the way they uh, distribute their force curves. One word on the Americans, they are far on the other side. I, there's almost no good shots of them. Here we see a few, few detailed shots of the Americans, but it's almost impossible to say anything about their technique. There, there's nothing I can say about their technique. As far as I know, for the US Federation, it was pretty devastating. They didn't make one medal uh, at the entire Olympic rowing game. As an Austrian, we're used to that. Hold on. Austria has made more Olympic medals in rowing than the US at the Olympic Games 2021. No, Austria hasn't made. Magdalena Lobnik happens to be from Austria and made an Olympic medal. That's how you have to put it. And as great as the Americans row, um, it didn't, it just wasn't enough to make a medal. They were only fourth. There are a lot of people very happy to be an Olympic finalist. Okay, ladies and gents, thank you very much for watching. It was a very long video analysis. I'm not going to start and edit this video. I, I, I feel it's going to be a long one. Let me know what you think of that format. Is it more interesting? Is it less interesting? Should I keep the video shorter? And now I would love to hear your thoughts on that race. There are probably so many things that I missed, so many background stories, so much more information, different opinions. Who says that I'm right all the time? So let me know what you think, what, what is the gossip that you heard? What, what is the actual, what are the facts that you heard about? and of some of the teams, what, what was going on. Let's, join, let, let's, let's start a discussion here. Thank you very much for watching. Subscribe to artandtraining.com. Visit artandtraining.com, the website, and I see you in the next video. Share, subscribe, like, so I can spend more time on making such long videos. All the best.